five. Yes. Uh. <clears throat> All right. Looks like we're live. Yep, I see myself. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Looks like we're good. Okay, let's do this. Sorry, just getting some things sorted here. Welcome, everybody. Four people. Welcome. <coughs> Excuse me. How are we doing? Uh, welcome back to our bi-weekly live Q&A here at Live Aquaria. Myself and Patrick here uh, are here to answer your questions. So uh, thank you all so much, first and foremost, for joining us live here on Facebook. Uh, we've got quite a few questions to get through. I know we will only be able to, we only have so much time. Um, but we'll go ahead and go through the questions we have today. And then, um, yeah, definitely look forward to the, the following week. Uh, so just as a reminder, all these questions we're going through today are coming from submissions from our website. So if you go over to liveacquaria.com and head to the homepage, there's a banner further down, a little bit further down the page where you can submit your question. Um, so it's a simple, easy form. You submit your question and we'll add it to our list and uh, you may be picked for a chance to win one of four $25 Live Aquaria gift, uh, gift certificates. So we'll have uh, four winners picked today after today's live stream. Um, so thank you to everyone who uh, participated. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question and thank you all for joining us too. So uh, I think without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first question, I actually don't know who submitted this. I think it was kind of an anonymous question, but it was a question about uranema disease and what it is. Patrick. Okay, so uranema is a, uh, it's a protozoa disease that um, is in marine fish. Um, some fish are more susceptible to it than others. Um, a lot of people have trouble with like green chromas, for instance, that's because they are one of those fish that is more susceptible to getting uranema and also antheus too. So those two types of fish are huge in the saltwater world, but are very problematic for uranema infections. And a lot of times it is, um, it shows up almost seasonally, like if we almost find like we have more trouble with it certain times of the year and also shipping stress too um, causes a lot of infections as well so sometimes they'll um, for instance the wholesaler will pack the fish and the fish will all appear fine and then um, the fish will arrive the next day and you'll get a bag with um, fish that appear to have like grayish blotches or even red sores on the fish that's a telltale sign that's a uranema infection so uh, generally you see it at first as a gray raised patch that's the protozoa on the fish right there and um, you'll have a secondary infection that will actually lead to like a red ulcer or an open wound on the fish so um, in an aquarium uh, you got to be careful if you do show if you do have fish that have any of those symptoms, you want to remove the individuals right away and get them quarantined um, and treat them from there. Um, the fish in the tank, they can, they are still going to be exposed to the protozoa. So you want to make sure that you go in there and do a good gravel vac because the protozoa can uh, hang out in any debris in the tank. So any substrate or attached decor or anything like that. So you want to make sure you go and you thoroughly clean the tank and look for more visible symptoms on the fish that are residing in the tank. But the fish that have any symptoms, get them out of the tank right away and quarantine them. Um, and you can treat them from there. Um, treatments include freshwater baths, doing a three to five minute bath. Sometimes you can even do it longer if the fish is uh, just beginning to show symptoms or if it's a uh, larger fish or stronger fish. Um, could probably last upwards of 10 minutes in a freshwater dip. Uh, make sure that when you do do a freshwater dip, the water that you're dipping them in, the pH is similar. That's a lot of, uh, that's one mistake that a lot of people make when they do a freshwater dip is they do not adjust the pH. So a lot of the times the fresh water will be uh, significantly lower and you're taking a fish from a higher pH and adding them to a low water. So then you're adding additional stress to the fish by putting them in that fresh water. So you wanna make sure that the pH is pretty close, you know, 
if your tank is like 8 to 8.4, you want to make sure that that water is at least 7.5 so that you don't add additional stress. Ideally, you want to get it as close as possible. And you also want to make sure that the water is the same temperature too. Mm -hmm. You don't want to put the fish in freezing cold water or something like that. You know, that's kind of common sense. But you'd be surprised how many people kind of panic and they grab some water from the tap and they throw the fish in there and they ultimately mm -hmm. kill it by doing a freshwater dip. So you want to make sure that you do a little bit of planning first. Make sure that the water is... Um, the same temperature and the same pH. Put them in there, use an air stone to gently aerate the water. You don't want to add um, too much oxygen because then that could cause more stress or more agitation. Um, and you want to closely monitor the fish for anywhere from three to five minutes and like I said, upwards of 10 minutes depending on you know the size and the strength of the fish. Uh, that's a good first line of defense when it comes to uranium uh, infections is to do a freshwater dip. Once you're in the quarantine tank, you want to treat that water. Um, you can use a formalin-based medication. That's probably the best thing for your anemia, anything that's formalin-based. And you want to make sure that it's 37% um, formaldehyde. Some of the uh, lower formalin-based medications like Riddick and stuff like that are only like in the teens. That's not going to be quite as effective as using um, straight formalin. Um, other than that, you can do freshwater baths. I would do it, you know, every 24 hours. Um, and uh, the formalin, too, uh, reduces the oxygen in the, the water, too. So you want to make sure that you continue to do filtration and aeration in your quarantine tank because the oxygen level is going to go down. So it's not unusual to see the fish kind of go up towards the surface. And the effects of the formalin is only good for about one to two hours. After that, it kind of dissipates. Um, so you can do that treatment every 24 hours until symptoms include, um, you know, go away. But make sure you keep a close eye on the uh, inhabitants in the tank. And if there's any more that show symptoms, make sure you keep pulling them out because that's how that that's how you're going to break that life cycle of the protozoa. Awesome. So uh, thank you, Patrick. Yep. Uh, so just real quick, uh, I think I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, Dr. Nick will not be joining us for this live Q and A today. Um, but uh, he's actually traveling here to our Wisconsin facility where yep. Patrick and I are. So um, definitely look for some content that later this week. We'll look to see what we can do um, with Dr. Nick for his visit here. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, that covers that. So next question is from Andy. Uh, he's looking for best freshwater plants for beginners. Okay, so freshwater plants, um, that's kind of a, that's a, a loaded topic for sure. Um, mm -hmm. When you speak, when we talk about uh, freshwater plants, we're talking about basically breaking them into three categories. You have your background plants, so those are the plants that are going to go in the back. Those are the tallest ones. Your mid-ground plants that are going to be, you know, fill up the middle of the aquarium. They're not going to, like, overpower the stuff in the back, but they're going to be taller than the stuff in the front, which we call the foreground plants. Uh, so that's generally how you break them up is in those three categories. And then from there, you have plants that obviously require um, higher light versus lower light. Um, and then you also have plants that require uh, CO2 injection in the tank, so they need extra carbon in order to grow. Um, so generally the higher light plants and the plants that need uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide added to the water, those are gonna be your um, expert only, or your, you know, your more difficult plants to mm -hmm. care for. So, but generally speaking, if you're looking for a beginner plant, you're gonna be one that's gonna grow under normal aquarium lighting and that's going to be um, happy with the amount of carbon, free carbon that's in the water that the fish um, ex from their respiration. So a good place to start, um, java ferns are great. They're pretty hardy. Um, they grow relatively slow. It's a pretty tough leaf. So even if you have some uh, fish that like to chew on them, like uh, angelfish or any type of cichlids or even uh, some of your larger catfish that are going to push them out of the way or dig them up or something like that. The java ferns are pretty good. Uh, Nubia, same thing. Nice thick leaf. Um, grow very slow, but they're a hardy plant. Uh, some of your sword plants, those are great mid-ground to background plants. Um, they'll do well. Um, java moss, mm -hmm. any types of ferns. I already said that. Um, Valsaria, that's another background plant. Grows really tall. Pretty hardy plant, grows quickly, um, sends off little runners and stuff like that, so you can kind of have chains going through the tank. Um, Cryptocorn, any of those are really good low light plants as well. So there's quite a few out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. 
quite a few out there. Yeah, 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 for sure. I know you named a few that I've kept in the past, and yeah, it's. Uh, I guess speaking from personal experience, I have always been kind of like I, I definitely don't have a green thumb either for aquariums or for gardens or anything like that. But yeah, speaking to some of those, the fur and the cryptic corn, like even for me, who's not like a plant expert, uh, I had pretty good luck. I think you know, I really yeah. you know, water quality, temperature, you know, just keeping an eye on them. Pruning was a big thing I learned. Yep. Yep, for um, sure. Kind of pruning at the right time too. So. Yeah, and the tank mates too will yeah. really uh, can make or break your setup too. Because if you have like silver dollars or something, that they're just going to eat the plant. So mm -hmm. you, no matter what you do, it, it's going to fail. Um, moss balls too. That's another one that I just saw. Um, mm -hmm. They're really hard to get nowadays, but if um, hopefully they start coming back in the the marketplace soon, those are a, a favorite. Um, banana plants. Yeah, growing up, those yeah. were always fun too. You don't yeah. see them very often but if you do see them it's a cool plant so this actually kind of segues nicely into another question related to freshwater plants a little further down on our list but you're talking about availability of freshwater plants there was actually a question recently submitted by andy or an andy who's asking why don't we currently have any freshwater plants on stock so it sounds like uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit i mean availability is always yeah well, I mean, we've, sure. we've kind of talked about availability inventory in the past for aquatic life. I mean, we are talking about live living animals and things. So um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of that same sort of things we've shared in the past applies here also to plants. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I know right now we're currently working um, uh, with our plant vendor and possibly bringing in different plant vendors too. Because there's all different types of plants ways to offer plants i mean there's some that are grown in you know tubes or there's tissue culture mm -hmm. plants stuff like that because a lot of people want a a plant that's <coughs> hardy and it doesn't have any pests so tissue culture plants is kind of the way to go mm -hmm. um generally it's a smaller plant but it's the best way to ensure that there is no um like snails that's or anything snail. like that you know that can get in your tank and then they can lead to you know problems and a bad experience yeah yeah for me, I like love snails, but I totally get it. Like, <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next question is from Kevin. Yes, I have a 120-gallon tank with a drilled overflow corner boxes, top and bottom slots. Do you, I place drains on top and bottom or just top? Top and bottom slots. So this question right here, so um, drilled tanks are... are you know, it, it's an option. A lot of people like that because it's it's pretty clean. You can get it right up close to the wall. Um, and then you have those uh, corner filters and it's basically hiding the plumbing. So inside those, those, um, those slots, you're gonna have two holes. So you're gonna have a smaller hole and a bigger hole. The bigger hole is um, reserved for your drain and your smaller hole is for the return line. So that's the water that's coming back from the filter. So generally the way those are designed is the water overflows on the top and then there's also some slots in the middle so water as water overflows down it will actually draw water up through a channel inside the um the overflow corner the plastic piece there so generally you just want to drain at the top because if the water has to overflow or as the water overflows and it fills up the corner um the the, the more it has to fall the louder it's going to be so generally you want it to be nice and high in the overflows. That way it's not like really, really loud. Just trust me, it gets annoying. Mm. Um, so yeah, the overflow boxes are usually designed to be filled at least three quarters of the way. A lot of those uh, drains are adjustable so they can slide up and down depending mm. on how, how high the overflows are. It's kind of like a universal drain. Um, but you want it to be pretty close because at the top of that, it's kind of shaped in a J, or at least the old ones are shaped in a J. There's an actual like kind of like a little air vent there and that's going to like break your siphon um so that way if you lose power too um it won't siphon all the water down into your sump and overflow, overflow. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah so generally just one drain towards the top and that way it'll work most efficiently and also it won't be as noisy for sure awesome uh got a question here from the live chat uh from jason hey jason uh wondering what are the best practices around blue green chromis is there a way to keep them from whittling the shoal down to just two fish uh 
Yeah, I mean, more the better. That way you can spread the aggression out for sure. Um, because you're just going to, like any other schooling fish, you're going to have dominant ones that are going to kind of pick on the weaker ones. So the more you have and the bigger the aquarium, the more space they are going to be able to swim and get away from each other. And make sure you feed them a lot because um, they're very active fish and the metabolism is very high. So make sure you feed them a good diet several times a day. We're talking three, four times minimum. I mean, if you can feed them every few hours, that would be ideal mm. um, because they are so active. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome. Hopefully that helps, Jason. Uh, next question is from Ronald. Uh, Ronald asks, is it safe to use an, in, excuse me, is it safe to use a deionizer on my RO system for a planted aquarium? What do I need to put back in to make it safe for my fish and plants? Um, so like a DI unit, so a lot of people use an RO system or an RO plus a DI. So for an, a planted aquarium that would, in my opinion, um, I mean, I don't know where you live and what your mineral content is. It's probably going to be overkill because a lot of the minerals that are in your tap water, your well water are going to be beneficial for your plants. So, but with that being said, you know, you could have a lot of iron in your water. There's, there's some reason why you're, you're filtering your water and um, you need to get those minerals back in the water. Mm -hmm. So um, there are uh, numerous buffers out there that are going to help add the minerals back into the water, but you got to be careful because there's um, phosphate, um, phosphate based buffers and that's what you don't want to use in your planted aquarium because that's going to actually contribute to um, algae growth. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be trying to not have algae growth by using RO water but then you're going to adding a phosphate buffer back into the water that's going to promote algae growth. So it's kind of like canceling mm -hmm. each other out in, mm -hmm. in that sense. So there is actually phosphate free buffers. Um, they're not quite as stable as the phosphate buffers, so you're gonna kind of work with them a little bit, and use a little bit more of them, continue to monitor them and so on, but that's something that you're gonna to wanna to add to get some of the minerals back in the water to get your DKH back up. And then there is also a lot of plant supplements out there, like uh, Seachem makes uh, Flourish. That's a good one to get the trace elements back into the water. So that's a good starting point right there for your planted aquarium. Um, in addition to using planted substrate too, because a lot of plants absorb the nutrient, uh, trace elements and nutrients through their roots. So you want to make sure you use a good planted substrate as well. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was just looking at this next question from uh, Stephen in the live chat. Uh, Stephen's asking about Christmas tree rock uh, and porites availability, can't find them anywhere. I was just checking our website too, just to make sure we didn't have them first. And it does not look like we have them in stock here. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you might have a better idea right off. Hand. Yeah, I haven't seen those in a while. The Parides rock um, does come through time to time. And then, yeah, also with the Christmas tree worms kind of like burrowing into them. Um, so generally when you buy the Christmas tree rocks, you're buying them for the worms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you'll get a, you'll get a rock that'll be like five, six, ten different colored worms. And it's, you know, it's very attractive. But they are not commonly... Um, seen these days um it's a good call up because i don't think i've seen any really this year to be honest with you you know every once in a while we get them through the coral farm we get a handful of them you know and they were you know the price just keeps going up and up on them mm -hmm. so just like everything else well, that's definitely something good for us to maybe take away too and maybe see like like patrick alludes you really like we talked about plants like plants for fish inverts like these are a day-to-day -day task for us here from an inventory sourcing perspective so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely, I think, another one to just add to the list, and yeah, maybe there is something out there we can find. So uh, I would say stay tuned, you know, sign up for our emails, Divers Den, or, or the regular promotional emails too, because uh, most likely we'll be communicating to you guys through those channels yeah. when we do have something newly available, especially the Divers Den, because I'm assuming, first and foremost, we would probably get them in the Divers Den and, you know, get them in here, get them in good condition, and then offer for them sure. up there. Yeah. Um, so I'd say check out Divers Den for sure. If you haven't already signed up for the Divers Den email alerts, I'll put a link in the chat here too, but uh, head over to liveacoria.com and uh, make sure you get signed up. You know, and a lot of people, you know, they, you hear about, you know, COVID and um, freight space and all. So it's still a problem for us in the fish world because our stuff is collected and it's shipped essentially, you know, overnight from these um, far off places, you know. So 
it's not uncommon for a lot of the airlines to bump cargo. Like we, a few weeks ago, we, we had a big Indo um, order that was coming in and it got bumped for whatever reason, you know, if the airlines can get more money from, from something else mm -hmm. and it's not uncommon for, for our cargo to get bumped and then it's, who knows, then we're just waiting for the next available um, air, you know, flight to get us, to get it here. So, you know, we deal with that stuff a lot more than we used to. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're hopefully. doing the best we can. Definitely. Uh, hopefully, okay, it looks like the link just went through. I just added it to the live chat here, guys. Uh, a link to the divers and email alerts. Sign up. You can make sure you get either fresh water or salt water or both, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with divers and uh, alerts either, that's from our divers and WYSIWYG store. That's a Monday through Friday release every day, uh, Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. CST. So we have uh, sort of three different releases throughout each day. There's a sneak peek at around 1 p.m. And mm -hmm. then at 5 p.m. CST, we have a Marine and then a freshwater update email that goes out to you with all the new uh, WYSIWYG items that are available for that day. So of course, since these are WYSIWYG, they are one of one, which means that one, that one item is gone, it's gone until we can find another one. But again, it won't be like the one you just looked at. So uh, definitely always encourage people to, uh, you know, if you're looking for that, uh, that one of one WYSIWYG experience, Divers Den is where, where it's at really. Um, and uh, you know, we do a lot of here, Patrick is really the head of that in a lot of ways here at the coral farm here with husbandry team, um, overseeing the day-to-day -day care of these animals, making sure they're quarantined, conditioned, and fed properly before they're even offered up for sale in the Divers Den store. So um, I guess to kind of segue too, we have our live dive sale every Monday at 7.30 p.m. CST. That's another great opportunity, actually, if you're looking for some high quality aquatic life. Um, we offer that once a week on Monday at 7.30 p.m. CST. It's usually around 11 to 14 items, sometimes more. Fresh water, salt water, and um, there's some great deals in there as well as giveaways, freebies, and all sorts of fun stuff. So you might have yeah. caught the one yesterday, last night. Uh, that was actually for Tuesday because of Labor Day. But uh, again, we usually do this every Monday at 7.30 p.m. CST. So um, yeah. Definitely go over to Facebook event page and RSVP to either the live Q&A like we're doing today or the live day, live dive sale every Monday and uh, you'll be up to date. Yeah, it's your opportunity to see the fish swimming around yeah. and just, you know, doing their thing, you know. And lately I've been doing a lot of um, not reef safe fish too. So if you're looking for some triggers and puffers and stuff like that, because most of the time I was always curated to reef, reef safe stuff, but now I'm trying to throw in some different things. So. Yeah. Awesome. Requests, anybody looking for something special, I might be able, we might have it here and we can throw it in there. For sure, for sure. Cool. Uh, Steven, you say thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, hopefully that helps. <clears throat> All right. Next question. Okay. Why does, this is from David, why does the end of my uh, alkaline dose line continually have crusting white buildup? Any way to prevent this? Okay, so what I'm thinking here is he has his dosing lines situated just uh, slightly above the water level in your sump, for instance, that's usually where you put them. Um, so usually the water that, when it's dosing, it doesn't, the water doesn't constantly, or the, the buffering or, or whatever it is, cal calcium, whatever you're dosing, mm -hmm. doesn't constantly go through there. So as it's in between dosing uh, times, the water is evaporating in the line and all that's left behind is the mineral and, it's, and that's what's causing it to crystallize and clog up. Um, you can try putting the line underneath the water. That way you eliminate the air getting in there and then the solution will um, evaporate and then uh, hopefully you won't have a clog. We've done that here, works, as cool. simple as that. Sometimes the simplest solution is the best, right? Yeah, I mean, I would still continue to moderate because uh, you might still have a little bit of buildup in there, mm -hmm. but it might not be as often. All right. So this next question is from Rachel. Uh, question is, once you have the water levels finally figured out, what fish should you start integrating into the tank without having to worry about wasting money? Assuming she means like water quality levels? Yeah, the way I, re I read this is that um, once they've gone through the nitrogen cycle and your water is, is stable, you know, you're not going through a pH swing or a nitrate swing. Um, stocking guide, I mean, you should have had a stocking guideline from the beginning. So what type of fish do you want to keep in the tank? And also by aggression level, you want to make sure you had the least aggressive fish first and the most aggressive fish last. So this is where a lot of people get into trouble 
where mm-hmm. they kind of like impulse buy and they just kind of throw something in there. So if you're gonna plan on stocking your aquarium in the beginning and you don't want to, you're worried that it may not quite be right, um, you want to make sure that you add something very peaceful and hearty. So if it's a, a freshwater tank, you could maybe throw in some Corridora catfish. They generally don't bother anybody and they're pretty hearty. Or any sort of live bearers are usually okay as well. Um, smaller tetras are good too. Um, as for salt water, I mean, it really, really, you got to stick to your um, stocking guideline because this is, like I said, you, yeah. you go impulse shopping, that's when you run into a lot of trouble. You end up buying something like a, a hawkfish or something like that, and the thing turns into a terror. I mean, mm-hmm. it could be, it's a really hardy fish, um, but you want to add a fire fish the next week or something like that, the hawkfish, I guarantee, is going to chase it around. Yeah, I guess, yeah, to kind of just... And out of that, we've talked about this before. It's always good to have a plan going into building an aquarium. You yep. know, just thinking about it, thinking about what you want to keep, both your short-term and your long-term goals, and uh, where you want to go for your tank build. It's always a good way to start. Yep. All right. Next question is from Austin: Is a Midas blenny a good beginner fish, and can they get off of uh, just two to three feedings a day? He heard some people said they need more than that, but other people said that they'd be just, that would be sufficient. So. Uh, Midas blennies, I mean, believe it or not, even though they're kind of a perching blenny, they can be an extremely active fish. You'll see them often if the aquarium's good size. They really like to be up in the water column, and they'll grab stuff from the, the water column, whether it be food or, you know, they may scoot a fish along or something like that. But two to three feedings a day in your average size aquarium, like, say, 75 gallons or so, should be should be enough. Um, if it's in a bigger aquarium with, you know, really, really strong flow, you may, not, you may have to feed them a little bit more. But generally, two to three times should be good for, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because he didn't say the tank size. Yeah, I think two to three times should be fine. Mm -hmm. And make sure you give them a good variety. I mean, I've seen them eat pellets and frozen and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. too. So So other than the feed aspect, I guess, to kind of get back to the other part of the question, I guess, are they a good beginner fish I oh mean, what yeah. would be your recommendation yeah there? for sure uh i mean they can be a little territorial so any other rock dwelling fish they may kind of uh chase um if it's the same color for mm-hmm. sure like i think like back to the firefish goby i mean they probably won't be able to help themselves you know because it's another rock dwelling fish hopefully if you wanted firefish you put those in first and the mite is plenty after um, but generally, yeah, they're pretty hardy fish, and uh, they're a good beginner for sure. Um, I don't think you regret having, owning that fish. Awesome. All right, this next one is from Janet. Uh, I want to st- I want to install a water filtration system in my house. What is the best to purchase so I can use the water for a freshwater fish tank? Um. So generally. Uh, a regular carbon filtration system would work fine. I mean, like, I don't know, a brand name like Culligan comes to mind. So the carbon is going to remove a lot of the, uh, like, like if it's uh, tap water, for instance, like city water, they're going to add chlorine to the water. The, ca- the carbon is going to remove that. Um, if you have a lot of iron in your water, a uh, simple water softener will help with that, too but we'll leave some of the other minerals behind. That will be okay for the tank. I mean, you could go as crazy as getting a, a whole RO uh, reverse osmosis system for your house. I mean, that's people do it for um, various reasons. You could do that for your aquarium, but you gotta make sure that you add some of those minerals back into the water. Um, ideally, what you probably have to do is get your water tested and go to like a water filtration specialist and see what um, they recommend, you know, because having some minerals in the water is perfectly fine for fish. You don't have to have completely everything stripped out of the water if you're going to do fresh water, for sure. Awesome. All right. Uh, Next question is from Barbara, and I think maybe we're down to our last two questions. So, uh, yeah, from Barbara, can I get two, can I keep two different plecos in the same tank? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, keeping two plecos in the same tank is not unheard of. Um, you want to make sure most plecos are nocturnal, so, you know, they don't do a whole lot during the day. So you want to make sure that you have a lot of hiding places for them. Um, so that way they can kind of retreat and get away from each other. If you only have like one or two hiding places, they're going to fight for sure. But keeping different genus of plecos usually works out pretty well too um, because different genus of plecos generally eat different things. Some might be more of a detritivore or, you know, eat algae while some of them eat more wood, you know. So generally, as long as you have different genuses, they may just ignore each other as long as they have a, a place to hide. 
And you got to make sure you have a good size aquarium too. A lot of pecos get enormous. Some of them stay small, you know, three to four inches. Um, I know we have a 180 gallon tank that's probably has about four or five different genuses of yeah. pecos with tons of rocks, and they just they all have their little cave that they retreat to. They come out, they eat, they go back in, and everybody's fine. Some are getting really big too. I think yeah. the other way. Well, yeah, we have like the luteus that's seven, getting eight, pretty nine big. Inches. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. We'll have to get you guys a shot of that when we get some good shots. Yeah, it's got some big, like, you know, six, seven inch tall Ultima Angels mm -hmm. in it. Captain Breath is a beautiful thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, before I get to the last question, I just want to remind you all about a couple of different things we got going on here at Live Aquarius. So, it's September. September for us uh, this year is Customer Appreciation Month. So, we had last weekend some site wide campaigns going out. Um, we're going to have another campaign coming up this weekend. So, stay tuned. Um, be you know be attuned to socials and your e email inbox to keep up to date with what you're going to get. We got some great deals coming up again every weekend in September. So we got come up some still coming up this weekend. Um, what else? Oh, we also have our photo contest coming on. So we're actually today is the first uh, full week of submissions that so far since we started last Thursday the first. So um, we've gotten some really great submissions so far. We'll be actually sharing some of those with you guys tomorrow just to show you some of the cool stuff hopefully inspire you to share a picture of your own. Uh, but head over into Live Aquaria also, to the, right on the homepage, liveaquaria.com. There will be a banner uh, for you to submit your own aquarium. Mm. And we welcome all, saltwater, freshwater, all sorts of reef aquariums. We want to see what you have. So uh, there's no limit to submissions. You can It's one photo per submission, but um, we are giving away three different uh, prizes. We're giving away a two $100 gift certificates and then a grand prize uh, one grand prize winner will receive a $500 gift certificate. So again, uh, we want to see your photos. Head on over to liveaquaria.com and submit your photo today or photos. And uh, yeah, be be on the lookout for uh, social social updates uh, this later this week, either tomorrow or probably Friday at the latest. We'll be sharing you know five to ten some cool stuff that we've got um, so far. So that is through the 25th of this month, and then we'll be announcing all of the winners, the $500 gift certificate and the two $100 gift certificates on the 1st of October, so that's a Saturday. So be on the lookout for that. That's another thing we got going on. And then of course, like I mentioned also, we have our live dive sales every Monday at 7.30 p.m. CST. So um, if anybody happened to catch that last night, uh, we really did a lot with our production quality and we're hoping to do that same thing with the live Q&A here in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, I think that's that about covers it right now. Right There's actually one question from Kenny here in the chat. How many two inch fish can I put in a 25 gallon tank? Well, um, well, I'm hoping that's probably a freshwater tank. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, in a perfect world, you could probably get 10 to 12 two inch fish in there, but you gotta make sure that you uh, stock it slowly. You wouldn't wanna put 10 to 12 of them in there overnight. You know, you'd probably wanna add three or four wait a week or two let the beneficial bacteria you know recolonize to make up for that additional waste and then add another three or four and so on until you get up to that so it looks like he's seen salt. oh salt water um we're gonna come into like some aggression problems for sure um there's not many fish that could live in a 25 gallon tank peacefully i mean you could do a group of uh chromis but they may kind of bicker with each other like we talked about earlier. There's not a lot of room for them to get away. Um, even a pair of clownfish being in that size in that size tank may be too territorial to tolerate yeah. much other fish. Um, so that's going to be a tough one. I mean, even like maybe a clown goby, that mm -hmm. would probably be okay. Or one cotterns or a bangai cardinal would be okay. Um, but you're going to be very limited in your choices yeah. in that size tank. I had a very similar situation about six years ago it's actually been a minute since i set up a saltwater tank of my own um but yeah about six years ago i set up a about a 25 gallon saltwater tank and yeah not really honestly not really knowing a whole lot about it kind of you know kind of came to reality pretty quickly i, I think i really only had a firefish and a clongoey yep. i think that was it yep. really yep. and i had some inverts and like i was trying to build all the corals and stuff like that but yeah. um yeah i mean it's hard. It's hard in that space for sure. Um, all right, we're going to take one more question and then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, let's see. Well, here's a good one. I think, well, 
I think this one ties in good to what we've been talking about. This one here? About. Yeah. Okay. I'll let Patrick pick. So that's from Gareth. Gareth's asking, I recently added a Bangai Cardinal to my 70-gallon tank. I have a pair of clowns, one Clarks, and a small purple tang. Within a day, they had killed the Bangai. I wonder if you have any advice on what fish I could add so I don't have the same problem. So this goes back talking about that whole stocking, mm -hmm. you know, guidelines that we talked about. So um, Gareth has a 70 gallon tank, which is a pretty good sized tank, but I would definitely say it's on the smaller end of saltwater keeping. And he has um, a pair of Clarky clowns, which are definitely uh, brutes when it comes to clownfish. I mean, they will definitely um, chase other fish. I mean, they're definitely little angle biters. I mean, they'll go after <laughs> bigger fish, much bigger than them. Um, never mind smaller fish um, in a purple tang, which is one of the most aggressive fish from that genus, the Zebrasoma genus. Um, so now Gareth has a tank, um, a good sized tank with only, it sounds like three fish in there. So now he's going to, uh, has, he's having trouble adding fish because a Bangai Cardinal is a pretty peaceful fish. I mean, they definitely don't always play well with each other, but when it comes to other fish, they're very, very timid. Um, so the Cotterns, prob uh, the, the Clarkies probably um, chased them around because they are territorial. They probably claim the bottom of the tank and the purple tank is just kind of, you know, doing his thing, tooling around the tank. So adding fish to this tank is going to be challenging because you're going to want to get fish that aren't going to um, uh, pose a threat to both the Clarkie and the purple tank. So, uh, you're going to need to add probably a bigger fish, something that is going to intimidate the purple tang, even though he does is going to have a chip on his shoulder because that's just what that genus does. So you're probably looking at a larger angelfish, um, something that's going to um, not not outgrow this tank, and that's your other problem. If you're planning on keeping a 70 gallon tank for you know that's it, like you're not planning on upgrading, that's going to limit you as well because most of your bigger angelfish are going to need a tank that's six feet long. Um, but the purple tang is going to need a bigger tank, so I hope you plan on getting a bigger tank anyways. But I would look at a larger angelfish, um, a fish that um, will probably won't bother either of them or pose a threat would be a, a, a hawkfish. Um, they lack a swim bladder, so they just kind of perk, perch on the rocks and hop around, and most fish don't really tolerate them. The, cl the clownfish may scoot them out of the way if they come over to their half of the tank, but um, hawkfish are pretty intelligent. They'll, um, they'll find their own little niche in the tank. Um, a schooling fish, something that's really going to distract and um, be kind of like a dither fish in the tank that's going to um, confuse the clownfish, you know, Antheus, Chromis, even some... Um, more of like your, you'd call them like reef safe damsels, like Talbot, Springer Eyes, stuff like that. Those are gonna kind of disperse throughout the tank and really distract some of those fish. Those are, those are probably good, be good fish to start with um, to really break this tank up from its um, vicious cycle that it's in right now. So these two fish are definitely fish that I would put at the end of my stocking guideline for sure. Awesome. All right, well, I think that covers this week's live Q&A. Um, like as I mentioned at the beginning of this, we do this every other week, so uh, stay tuned, uh, not next week, but the following week. We'll be doing the same thing at 1 p.m. CST. We're answering your questions live. We'll be also picking four winners for a $25 gift certificate. These winners are people that had submitted questions via the form on the website, so if you're interested in getting your question answered while also being put into running for a $25 gift certificate, uh, head on over to Live Corey. Click on the banner on the homepage that says to submit your question. And uh, yeah, we'll, get, we'll add it to our list. And then if it's picked, it's picked. So good luck. Um, I think other than that, we're good. Yep. I want to thank Patrick thank for you. taking time out of his busy day, caring for mm -hmm. all the fish to answer your guys' question. And first of all, for, first and foremost, thank you all for joining us and providing your questions in the live chat. Um, we hope you all have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.